Hey, everybody. Welcome. We are uh, here with some uh, wonderful guests. Actually, you know, we are here with some of my favorite people to play role playing games with, like in the whole world. Uh, I am I'm Monty Cook. And uh, with me tonight to talk about uh, our old game that we played way back when um, in the Talus setting uh, is Chris Perkins, who is the uh, primary narrative designer of d d and Bruce Cordell, who is a designer at uh, Monty Cook Games, and Sean Reynolds, who is a designer and uh, developer at Monty Cook Games. So we all, we all worked together for a while. We did for a long while, right? Uh, because we played uh, Talus back when we all worked for Wizards of the Coast. We were all working on D and D. In fact, it was right at the time when we uh, were started working on Third Edition Dungeons and Dragons. Like a lot of people, I said to myself, "This is a great time to start a brand new campaign." Um, and so what I actually did was I took the current campaign that I had been playing and I advanced it like 5,000 years or, or, or thereabouts um, and started a brand new campaign that I called Talus, which was a, uh, a setting, an, an entirely urban setting. It was a city, but it had massive dungeons and caverns and whatnot underneath it um, <clears throat> that had been just recently discovered so that there was sort of like a gold rush kind of mentality of people going down into the dungeons, people up in the city uh, being affected by things coming up from the dungeon, making money by selling stuff to adventurers going down there and whatnot. Um, and I guess I should mention before we go too much further that uh, you know one of the reasons that we've all gathered to talk about this is because uh, my current company, uh, Monty Cook Games, is kickstarting Talus, uh, which is a product that I came out with uh, in, during the D20 time, it was compatible with third edition, and now we are kickstarting a, a 5e uh, compatible version as well as a uh, Cypher system compatible version. Big, beautiful, deluxe book, complete campaign setting, everything you'll ever want in a, a game to take you all the way through your entire, you know, 20 levels of your game, if you want to go that far. Uh, and in fact, uh, it brings me back to my uh, what I was talking about before, because the city uh, is this massive urban setting with a dungeon underneath it, but it also has this unnaturally tall, impossibly tall and narrow spire upon which sits a, a giant dark fortress. And the reason that I did that was so that even at first level, as you're walking around, uh, your characters are walking around uh, the streets of Talos, you're always looking up and you're thinking, that's where we're going at 20th level, right? There's the end of the campaign right there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, when I started Talos, uh, I ran it twice a week with two different groups. I had an embarrassment of riches of fantastic players who all were very eager to want to uh, give this a try. I mean, back then, remember, everyone wanted to try third edition, and this was sort of the, the first campaign of third edition that started up. And so we had a Monday night group, and we had a Thursday night group. And people, they, we ran them concurrently, and they, they, they took place concurrently. So I had to keep very close track of where everyone was in the timeline so that if the Thursday night group did something that the Monday night group would hear about. I had to know when they would hear about it. And sometimes one group would get weeks ahead of the other, but I was, you know, kind of kept them all together. And the other thing that would happen and, and, and we're going to get into this probably quite a bit was um, the groups, people in the groups went back and forth uh, and, and switched back and forth. And Chris actually ran, was the, was the player who played, uh, always in both of them. He had uh, two twin brother characters that uh, uh, one was in each group. So Chris, why don't you start us off and tell us about your characters? So my elf twins were named Sarai and Circean. And the reason they were twins was I was, when I, when I realized I was going to land in both groups, I wanted the possibility of screwing with the other players and maybe switching them out occasionally. <laughs> and got Monty's got Monty's permission to do so. Uh, so one brother was uh, Sarai was the wizard. Uh, that was his his predilection, his destiny. But Circean was the jack of all trades. Who was 
he was like a multi-classing nightmare, basically. He was a fighter, <laughs> rogue, wizard, and probably something else. He took enough wizards so that he could pass himself off as his brother as needs arose. Um, <laughs> but, but, but actually, uh, being, so, so, being so multi-class and deluded, he was much less effective. Um, <laughs> so he had to really get by. He had to get by on his wits. But it was very fun on a meta level because at any given time in either group, Chris, only you and I really knew who you were actually playing. <laughs> yes. And sometimes I'm not sure who I was playing. <laughs> so I'm glad you were keeping track. Yeah. <laughs> the two characters, I think, ultimately were switching back and forth between groups way more often than anyone had any idea. Right. I mean, and everyone it, kind of knew, but... Yes. And it would not have been possible without the structure of the city that you had created because it kept the adventurers contained in an area where the two brothers could interact with each other offline and sort of right. figure things out and pull little switcheroos like that. Yeah, you know, in the, in the previous campaign that I had run just before this, there had been a lot of travel time. Yeah. Like, okay, we're going to go to this next place where there's an adventure and it's going to take us five days to get there. And I... I was, for whatever reason, I was just really tired of that. And so Talos is completely designed so that there is no travel time, right? You're in the city, you're down in the dungeon, you're back up in the city. And uh, it, it enabled me to do things like, uh, uh, you know, if, if somebody couldn't make it one week, it was really easy yeah. to just say, okay, they're off, you know, doing yeah. their job or visiting their mom or whatever. And, and, and then the next session they could be back uh, because it was all just right there. Yeah, I mean, the campaign slogan should have been like, in Paulus, adventure come to you. Like, that's just the way, it was, right? We just had to sit there and wait for the evil to come to us. It was great. <laughs> Bruce, why don't you tell us uh, about your characters? And let's let's also start talking about the differences between the two groups, because the two groups, the Monday night group and the, and the Thursday night group, were very different. Well, I began my career in Talos in the Thursday night group with a elf archer named Chanticleer. And uh, I was playing around with uh, some of the, um, the rules and the uh, prestige classes. I think it was a prestige class that I actually wrote that was a little bit broken, as I discovered as I went up in level. And so <laughs> getting a little tired of that, I changed to a paladin, an undead paladin called Farouk. And uh, he undead remained... Killer. Undead, what did I say? Undead Paladin? Yes, sorry. Killed Undead. I particularly hated Undead as this Paladin Farouk character. But for whatever reason, over a period of time, I was actually with the Monday, uh, excuse me, the Thursday night group, which we came up with the name of the Company of the Black Lantern. Was that the name of our group? Which mm -hmm. was cool to have a brand. But despite <laughs> the brand, I, I, for some reason, I needed to go to the Monday night group probably because of scheduling. And I, I came in with this fantastic character, I thought was Canabulum, who was a Minotaur wizard. So he was multi-classing, so he lost a few wizard levels for some of his uh, Minotaur toughness, but he turned out to be very effective. And uh, uh, I don't know, I joined this, I joined some of the highfalutin things that happened with the Monday night group. It seems like sometimes some of the things that happened with the Thursday night group, well, were very funny, but very fun. But uh, you know. <laughs> at one point they all became vampires. I miss except, that. Except my character. Was it Everybody your fault? Else was a vampire. N no, it was not. It was their fault. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that and explains. It, it's probably worth mentioning that the Thursday night group decided that all the care, all the players decided um, at the start that they were all going to be elves. Yes. And there's a contingent of of elves in the city that you know is. Racist might be too strong of a word, but they really liked being elves and thought that everyone else was not as good. Um, <laughs> and uh, the Thursday night group sort of embraced that and were kind of a group of haughty elves um, and kind of kind of full of themselves. And then sort of ironically, we're always getting involved with like shady things and and crime lords and whatnot where the monday night group was always like champions of lothian and going and bashing demons and being very very good and uh and sean tell us about your characters uh so i was mainly in the monday group and i played a swashbuckler type character named shurin 
who started out as a rogue and then multi-class to pick up some levels in fighter. And then eventually picked up a couple, about three levels in cleric because he was a romantic and he took the scribe scroll feat in the ranks of the calligraphy skill. And he was writing these very beautiful spell scrolls that cost twice as much. So he might as well just been making potions, but that's what I wanted to do. Uh, and he was this romantic guy. He had crushes on all these female NPCs and it was just, they never gave him any traction on that. Uh, <laughs> one was the, uh, the front desk person for the ghostly minstrel who the also, catered mostly to adventurers. Right. And she just had a policy of not dating adventurers. Cause she's like, I don't want to date somebody. And then they die. So, you know, <laughs> perfectly reasonable. Levels left later, you know, when I finally retired, Monty told me that uh, they finally ended up becoming a couple. So right. she teamed them. Uh, you can just imagine working at a tavern that caters to adventurers. I mean, People are probably coming on to you all the time and then suddenly just not there anymore. <laughs> you just never see them again. And my character in the Thursday night group, which I was only part of for maybe about two months, was an elf named Akoru who was from like an elven land, didn't speak the common language very well. And so he was misusing phrases. He was a wizard. And I think his battle cry was, I have red pants because he happened to be wearing a red outfit. And he just, again, it's like the, that sketch from Monty Python. He just doesn't know the language well enough to be making 100% sense. I'm so glad Sean's here because his memory of things is just so crystal clear and mine is yes. a foggy a foggy half haze. He has he has legendary memories, so I'm, I'm really glad he's here yeah. too. Um, I uh, The thing I remember about Okoru and his red pants was, so this was third edition, so it's a very miniatures heavy kind of game. And we played with, you know, Dwarven Forge and, and lots of painted miniatures and everything. And I was very into painting miniatures at the time, painted everybody's uh, PCs. And I don't know why, I think I just, I had the red paint out and uh, <laughs> gave Sean's character red pants and yep, suddenly became just a thing. I have red pants. Yeah. For those who don't know, uh, we played upstairs at your house, Monty, in your game room, and you had an entire closet just stacked with Dwarven Forge boxes. And every once in a while, we'd come over and you would have built this intense table spanning set piece out of all these pieces. And I don't know how long it took you to build those things. I can only imagine. Um, but they were just astonishing to me. Cool. I have very fond memories of that too. I loved, I loved Dwarven Forge. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure it took me a long time, but I'm sure it was really fun. So I don't like mm -hmm. remember thinking that it was taking me a long time. How many of your encounters were like crafted just based on the miniatures that you're fixating on in the moment? Like, was that a... Or did you build the encounters first and then get miniatures for those encounters? Um, some of both, but I'm sure that like, it was probably more the former, right? It was more like, well, yeah. I just painted up a bunch of gnolls. Right, yes. Gnolls! We, we'd, we'd be sitting there and you'd have these glass cases of all these painted figures and I'd be looking at them going, geez, I hope I never, ever <laughs> see half of these things in the game because they're just terrifying. Forget about the glass cases. Wow. Yes. Right. Yes. And so you here, here's here's your future death on display. <laughs> <laughs> you were sneaky though, because you also used like uh McFarland action figures and weird toys and stuff to right. represent crazy ass monsters and demons up. There's a time that we were captured and we found that one orc who had the rune on his tooth and he pulled it out and it was like the the releasing spell for Okra Meshik, this demigod, and you brought out this weird like samurai monster character to represent this half orc demigod who we unleashed on our enemies and just ran because we could, we knew he would not stop if we were in his way. I'm sure Monty's still Okra Meshik somewhere, but I don't know. I can't find him. <laughs> that means he's loose someplace in the house. That's right. <laughs> that's, that's an example of one of the differences between the two groups is that, like, the company of the Black Lantern would be doing, uh, you know, stuff with crime lords. And oh, before this video started, we were talking about how they uh, were involved in this thing called The Boy Who Could Sing, which was a play that this crime lord guy funded and put, it, put together for his nephew to have a starring role, like his 10 year old nephew. And Andy Collins, who is mainly playing in that 
game, came to work the next day and said, like, oh, yeah, we just put on this play for this little boy and blah, blah, blah. And I said, that's cool. On Monday, our group killed uh, Moloch, the ordainer of the Galchut. <laughs> <laughs> Such a different feel. Yeah, but that uh, play where that boy was trying to sing, I was still part of the uh, Thursday night group. That was that was awesome. That's like one of the few memories I have because they're just so like crazy. It's like really, this crime lord needs this play to go off, and his his enemies are trying to scuttle it. Oh, but the poor little nephew, right? So he doesn't know. He just wants to sing. <laughs> uh, poor future think, crime lord. I think he was afraid that I think that he was afraid that someone was going to try to kidnap the nephew, right? And so yeah. your job was actually to to sort of provide protection. Is that, does that seem like, I, I think that's the way it was. Yeah, well, lots of shenanigans were happening. That's and there were doing. lots of shenanigans, And but, but you were trying really hard not to interrupt the play while all these, like, so, you know, I remember somebody, maybe it was, maybe it was it your character, Bruce, was like up in the, in the catwalk area, whatnot, above the, above the stage, like with a bow and... Yes, that's right, that's right. Because I was at the Archer Chanticleer, so it must have been me. I did, now that you say that, yes, I do totally remember taking sight lines and stuff. I'm like, don't hit the boy. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. Well, what other, what, what other fun, fun memories can you guys remember from that? from that game. Um, I, I had totally forgotten actually about the action figures. I, and in fact, I think again, Andy, who we're gonna be chatting with next week about Talos, uh, once kind of would, would just kind of sum up a session like, because because the two groups, like like Sean mentioned, right? We, we all worked at Wizards and so everyone would come to work the next day. And like, if you were in the Monday night group, you would talk to the Thursday night group and you'd talk about what you did. And Andy would just sometimes say, yeah, we had an action figure. <laughs> 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 like enough said right yes, yes i honestly don't know how you were able to keep tr how to keep the campaign going when the two groups are affecting the city so much as they were like the that's a that's an amazing undertaking as a dm did like how did you how did you note take that like there was so I before then I was not the kind of GM that or DM that that took notes, right? I just I, I have a decent memory and 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 would just remember. But for this campaign, I absolutely started taking pretty careful notes, um, basically of just anything that would impact the other group, and um, it forced me. And of course, that shows up of, in the eventual product too. It forced me to create a very robust and detailed calendar system for the setting, right? And so I knew that if you guys were on the 5th of harvest, but the other group was on the 17th of harvest, you wouldn't be able to interact. And there were a few times, I think, as a, as, as a group of players, we all kind of metagamed and forced it like, okay, well, we will just do nothing for a week so that we can, you know, be in sync with the Same other things group. Happen. Yeah. Because then we had those sessions where 10 of us would come together. Yes. Or convene around your table for one of these huge, often a, a set piece kind of battle scenario against some big bad in an army of miniatures. <laughs> Wave, waves and waves that of miniatures. Yeah, that would Versus be the thing. Both twins at the same time, so it's just extra confusing for everybody who was in the group with him to be like, "Are you Cersei? Are you Sarah? What's going on?" Like, I personally did not know when you switched. <laughs> I did not know towards till the end of the campaign that you'd been switching a lot. I was just kind of like, "Oh, he's kind oh. of weird." Yeah, I was just like, just like "Why is he acting so much like a jerk tonight?" Right? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, What's wrong with Chris? Right? I wasn't uh, realizing you were playing a different. Like, it was <laughs> method, Bruce. It was <laughs> method. <laughs> so it, if memory serves ironically like if you were going to say that one of the two groups was made up mostly of jerks it would be the thursday night group but and i and i mean the characters i don't mean the players the characters were were but that isn't true of the twins that the 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 jerk of the two twins was Sarai, yeah. if memory serves, right? And yes. but he mostly was on the Monday night group, at least ostensibly. Correct. Yes. 
Yeah, Sarai was very much, uh, he wasn't a control freak, He but he did believe that he was destined for, you know, become some sort of super wizard, archmage. Which uh, one of them did? And he would do things, he would go off and do things on his own without telling the rest of the party. Um, there <laughs> once, was, once Sarai yeah. learned teleport, I think yes. that yeah. that started happening yes. a lot. What, was this there was a one, us? Okay. Yeah, I was going to say there was one scenario or one night we played, and I think it was Sarai who basically went off on his own and kind of stormed the tower and started to make up all these, like trick his way through a bunch of guards and defenses. And I was sure he was going to die. Like I and just tried to kept getting him into more and deeper and deeper and deeper into this isolation of being trapped in this stronghold by himself and just seeing how far I could go before I died. Yes, I think, uh, I wanna say that that was when you guys decided to take on the Dark Elves. And yeah. it was it was deep, deep, deep underground. And, and again, if memory serves, I think what actually then happened was Sarai's actions kind of brought a lot of trouble down on the rest of the group for what, <laughs> for what he did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he accomplished what he wanted to do, but what he wanted to do was not for the, Go ahead. I just re I just remembered. So to make the twins even more complicated, Circean was captured by the dark elves and replaced by a dark elf who was using magic to make himself look like it. So there was a while yes. there when there were sort of three of yes. them. Yes. <laughs> right. And that dark elf uh, was a lot of fun to play because he was a real um piece of work we uh was it the monday group or the thursday group that ended up banishing him into the sun <laughs> that definitely sounds like the monday group. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Yeah. yes yeah. what a, what a fitting end for a very very evil dark elf than to mm -hmm. yes the sun. i have a memory and maybe this is earlier in Premal, but did, didn't you have a character chris who there was a dragon and or some very large beast, and we're like, how are we gonna fight this creature? And you managed to jump onto the back of it, and we're riding around. Does this does this sound, or have you done Sorry. this so many times that you're like, oh, yeah. when have it's, I not done this? It's kind of a trope, so it's hard okay. to, All right. it may not, may not have been me, but it could have been me. <coughs> I, think I, do, so, I do remember definitely. once in the early campaign of Sean using a frying pan to basically hook a rope over a monster to pull it down to the ground, because it was missing <laughs> us from above. Yeah, that was the promo campaign. So okay. that was the that was the second edition, ten thousand years earlier campaign that led to Talos. Yes. Um, yeah, I, I do remember that. I was gonna say too. I rem the thing that I remember from that game because it was mostly the same players. Uh, so Chris, that was that was when you um, like the first time that you and I had ever played D anD D together was you joined the promo game and you were a lizard man. Um, and again, this was second edition D and D. And so, and I was pretty stingy with magic items anyway. And so I remember, uh, the group found like a potion of strength and you, this was like the first or second session that you played with us and the group just decided to give it to your character and you were like, great. And you pop the cork and just drink it right then and there. <laughs> and I remember thinking, what? No, you shouldn't do that. You should save it for the most important moment. And then I thought, no, <laughs> are fun. You shouldn't save it. Right. right. And, yeah. and, and the funny thing is, is that that memory stuck with me for so long. It actually, I would, I credit that memory as being, uh, part of the impetus for the cipher system where you've got these ciphers that are these one use things that are fun and cool and in but the idea is you just use them yeah. you don't yeah. you don't hoard yeah. them you don't wait right um and it was because that was vess i think was your yes, character's name that's right? correct yes and he, he was just sort of very impulsive and immor immoral and didn't really grok the you know the finer th <laughs> the finer points or nuance sort of escaped him but honestly that <laughs> That I, that sticks in my memory too, and that's less about the character and more about me. Like if I get a magic item, I want to use it right away. It I, makes I, perfect I, sense. Yeah, it, but, and up until that point, sheet. I had been the opposite, right? Yeah, and now and if I'm I use like, it, if I use it and I can do something fun with it, then maybe the DM will give me another one. You know, whereas if it's just sitting on my character sheet, 
it's not, nobody's getting anything out of it. Right. Right. How many times have we looked down at our character sheet and been like, I've got a push of strength, right? And the, like yeah. the pencil that you wrote it on is like faded because it's been yeah. sitting there so long. That's just dumb, right? Drink mm -hmm. it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> even, even if you're just, you know, sitting having dinner, just drink it. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Yeah. So the, so Chris's character jumping on the back of something. So, um, after the after the two campaigns, the Monday night group and the Thursday night group were done, um, I think we reached probably about 16th level or so. And and but the the storylines had kind of wrapped up and at whatever. Decided I wanted to run another game, and this time uh, uh, well, I was just going to run one a game a week. I couldn't do the two a week, but we decided to keep going in Talus. And so I think the timeline just advanced like a year or two or something like that. And then you guys created all new characters. And uh, the, you were in this, the characters were all in this giant uh, cavern that was filled with these like uh, metal catwalk crosswalk, you know, crosswalks and, and, and whatnot, connecting all these various levels. And the bad guys were these sort of steampunk uh, guys called the Shul who flew, they were flying around in big mechanical dragonflies. And uh, I remember, Chris, your character just leapt off the thing to, to get onto the back of one of these things. Yeah. And it was one of those things where, uh, so at the time I, I had this uh, mechanic that I glued together called Hero Points. Right. And uh, they basically allowed you to do crazy, crazy things. And I think you had to spend like up, I think you actually had to spend like three hero points to not die <laughs> as you would like trying to grab it. And then you managed to grab on and then you slipped off and you tried yeah. to grab it again. And yeah, fun that times. was fun though. The hero points were a great ad. I really liked them because it emboldened a lot of us. And it really sort of brought out a, a sort of a hyper heroic quality to the campaign, which at high levels, especially, is great. Yeah. And your, your campaigns tend to have a, a lethality to them, um, or at least there's a subtext of lethality, like every, everything can kill you. <laughs> <laughs> can you so, use the, uh, the optional rule that if you confirmed a crit and your confirmation roll was also a threat, you could roll again. And if that was the confirm, then it was just an instant. I forgot about that. And that actually killed Keith Strom's character uh, at one point because he got hit by an iron golem and it just critted him for like 90 points of damage. And he was just out and we were like, whoa, okay. Um, yeah, but that, that came in useful for you. <laughs> I remember that story very well, Sean. Why don't you tell us about that story? So my swashbuckler character, Shuren, uh, used a rapier and it had a crit range of, you know, 18 to 20. And I took improved critical, which improved it by another three. And then it got the keen enchantment, which meant I was critting on a 12, which I needed because I'm just doing a D6 plus one with this magic weapon, right? Sometimes I'd add some sneak attack. Mm -hmm. And we were uh, in the insane asylum in Talus that has all these insane wizards and they're all trapped in like years. Mathis, Mathis is that right? And like one of the wardens of that place is a beholder because he can just turn his anti-magic cone to like right. suppress a, a dangerous wizard. Um, and so we were in there and something had happened, like all these things, like these wizards had just like been freed from their cells. And this guy was just conjuring monsters and the, the beholder was attacking us. And Eric Mona's character, he was uh, playing a paladin named Zophus Adhar. And I was fighting something and, and Eric and I were fighting back to back and he was facing off against this beholder and every round the beholder's like, disintegrate Ray. And Eric's like, I have a great saving throw. I made it. It's like, okay, uh, finger of death Ray. And Eric, so he's basically having to make three horrible saving throws every single round. And he, three rounds in a row, he made them because he was a super charisma paladin, but he knew his luck was running out because if you're making three huge DC saves every single round, you're going to eventually fail. And realizing he needed help, I turned around and I'm like, okay, I'll stab the beholder too. No, he was on the opposite side of the beholder. So we were flanking the beholder. So I stabbed this thing, rolled a critical threat, confirmed that that was a critical threat, 
confirmed that, just killed the beholder in one hit, and then went back to what I was doing, which was just like one of my two glorious combat moments. <laughs> <laughs> I was always kind of like second, this is when you're a multi-class character who does some fighting, you're kind of like okay at it, but I was also <laughs> yeah. like backup healing and the skills rogue stuff too. So Eric's character normally did two or three times as much damage as I did every single round. So when I got the opportunity to just kill something in one hit, that was I remember visually thinking that it was just like, you know, Shuren was fighting whatever foe he was fighting. And then he just like turned around, popped this big balloon and, and then just kept fighting whatever he doesn't normally fight. <laughs> Nonchalantly, of course. I, I feel like said. in the Primal campaign that my, my, my character Caleb had a use, a use of that. And either, I don't know if it was a triple threat, but I, I did something and I had a dagger and I killed something and I was so surprised if you remember, I fell out of the chair backwards uh, out of <laughs> pure like, and you kill it. I'm like, what? And I just like, <laughs> run over backwards <laughs> and uh, making it a very dramatic kill. But I don't remember now what I was fighting or the, the situation. All I remember, of course, is falling out of the chair and everyone laughing. But <laughs> so I've got a bit of trivia about the Premel campaign. So our friend Michelle Carter was a player in that and a player in Talos as well. And in the Premal campaign, she played uh, some, I can't remember, she was a ranger named Sharien. And then the Talos campaign was 20,000 years later. I named my character Shurin after her under the assumption that language and names would have shifted in 20,000 years, but that had been passed down over time. And then the way that like William and Wilhelm and that sort of thing are different you know, regional variants of that. So my character is actually named for her, some hero of legend whose name is actually, or her identity is lost, but her name still carried forward. Does she know that? I don't think so. I don't think I told anybody that. I was just oh, waiting yeah. for somebody to pick it up. Well, you know, um, mm. speaking of names carrying over from one to the other, like the very name of Tallis comes from the fact, so in the original Premal campaign, John Ratliff played for a while, but then his life got busy and he couldn't keep coming. And so he said, I'm going to have to leave. My character will leave. And I say, okay, so what does your character go off and do? And this was like, you know, remember this was 10,000 years earlier, 20,000 years earlier or whatever. And the world was kind of young and everything. And he was like, I don't know. I go off and I find a, I found a city or something, right? I, I start up my own city. Well, his character's name was Ptolemaeus. And he founded the city of Talos. <laughs> so yeah. it's all thanks to John Ratliff. Where did the spire come from just idea wise was that like something based on your work on planescape or was that just weirdly no it didn't have anything to do with planescape spire um so uh this might be will will jog your memory so the um it turned out that a long time ago um I, the fortress got like pushed up off right, the ground because it was so place. evil, the yeah. earth was literally pushing it up, right? And so I just I loved that idea and that visual, and that's where that comes from, right? Yeah. It was just this idea that the, the, the fortress is so evil, the earth just pushes it as far away from it as it can, right? Um, yeah. At one point, the campaign went to the moon. The Primal campaign did, yes. Yeah, yeah, I remember that, yes. the Valis moon. Yeah, you um you you broke off a piece of the moon, yes, and 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 rode it back down to Earth. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of course we did. Of course we did. Yeah. And that was like the that was that was the big climactic <laughs> battle of that of the of that campaign, right? Because like a big there's a big black dragon, um, like a you know ancient red dragon or something. I don't know how it got to be ancient if it, the world was new, but whatever. Um, I'm sure there was a reason. And uh, <laughs> um, and so you were fighting this dragon as you were on essentially basically like a meteor yeah. coming Probably. down to the ground. Was that Father Claw? Yeah, I think, I think so. Well, I don't know. Uh, maybe. I think, isn't he like a god in Talos? He's definitely a god in Talos. He's a he's like a the god of evil dragons in Talos. Um, I met one or two characters in Premal that showed up, and one of them, if I remember correctly, was when we were early on in Premal. We came upon this place, and there was this weird tunnel straight through this uh, this this stone fortress. And we came up to it, and it, we realized it wasn't so much a tunnel as a human shaped uh, melted. Sh 
a shape that some entity shaped like a human had just passed through the stone of this castle and down, down, down into the earth. I think it was at Veyad. Does that sound Veyad familiar? The Veyad, Veyad the Slayer. The Slayer. And then later, of course, in, in Talos, when we heard came upon the name Veyad, my character and it was like, oh my, I remember that that tunnel made by someone <laughs> so powerful. They just walked through the the, the stone and created a you know a hole. So anyway, good impression. What's that? House Ladam and Talos is named after another villain from Premel. Yeah, yeah. Ladam was a was a bad guy in, in oh, Premel. Well. You're right. Yeah, so there's history. I I don't remember much about House Ladam. That was the that was the Monday groups um, thing, right? That was more of a Monday night group. Yeah, yeah, they're they're sort of the most evil of the ten noble houses in Talos. And yeah, uh, one of the distinguishing things about the the Monday group was often there would be stories that we would pursue that were very character specific. Like Michelle would have a story that sort of the whole party would rally behind. Whereas the Thursday night group, I always felt like we were kind of just doing things in a in a mob. <laughs> like no nobody nobody had their singular agenda really. We were just kind of fumbling around until we ran into until we ran into the drow and then we weren't fumbling anymore we we're just dying <laughs> <laughs> well but but the the cool thing that i remember about the thursday night group that, that makes it very distinct is is the thursday group i don't remember what happened but but some dark elf really pissed you guys off and so you you just you sort of rose a small army of elves and dwarves in talus mm -hmm. and marched en masse down to find uh the the big dark elf fortress down there and uh, you had if you remember the the thursday group had the it was the dwarves brought an ankylosaur that yes. they rode <laughs> i love that guy <laughs> that was a lot was. of fun yeah and that that yeah. was that lasted many many sessions that whole expedition down in did was that a successful expedition ultimately? No. <laughs> <laughs> what, what happened? They all died. The, the end. The end. <laughs> uh, is that when you got brought back as vampires? Well, they got brought back as vampires and then paladins in the city basically had to dust them all um, and bring them back from the dead and then they died again. So... <laughs> oh, oh <laughs> we were being hunted I, by paladins. <laughs> I think <laughs> I think Keith Strom was with the group at that time. Even though he was normally in the Monday night group, he brought his his paladin uh who I don't think was an elf, but I don't remember. Anyway, but he was this paladin of Lothian and uh, which is like the main god of lawful good and everything in the setting and um uh, yeah, the so the the Thursday night there was the it was a TPK. The Thursday night group got got wiped out by a it was a powerful lich, and the lich brought them all back. And Keith Strom's character was initially just animated uh, with his own his own like Holy Avenger sword, like because they were high level, right? His own Holy Avenger sword embedded in his in his chest forced to continually curse Lothian's name. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we laugh, but I don't think Keith enjoyed it very much. <laughs> no, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't think we ever had a TPK in the Monday Night group. No, no, we didn't. I do remember that Shuren died when we were in the Jewels of Parnath and we were kind of like following the footsteps of Ghoul the Half-God. And there's like all these undead remnants of him that were associated with his armor pieces. And I got killed by this thing and then immediately animated as like a wraith and I started attacking the group. And then Sue used turn undead because she was a cleric and she used turn yeah. undead to kill me and then <laughs> just raised it to raise me back. And I think the neat thing that happened with that was I asked you, do I remember anything from my time as being an undead? And you're like, yeah. And you just started throwing us some weird clues about Ghoul the Half God because as an undead creature who was made from the remnant of him, I suddenly had these like fragmented memories that kind of helped us steer where we were going next. Cool. Well, we have um, a couple of questions from uh, chat, it looks like. Um, 
So, uh, oh, here's a here's a good one. Um, are there any favorite NPCs that you guys remember from the campaign or campaigns? There was Lord Dalmothian, who was the head yes. of the house that we allied with against House Ladam. And uh, was he part dragon? Was it House House of Dragons? Maybe yes. was their alternate yes. name? They had a, They lived in a uh, the house that's actually shaped like a tower with a big dragon's head at the top. That's right. And the tower would lower itself down so the head was resting then, on the ground. Right. Yeah. And the jaws yes. would open up. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty swanky stuff. I think Sarai was a little jealous of that place. <laughs> <laughs> Shuren was very fond of Jebba Kanor, who is a sorcerer of the inverted pyramid, notable because she has this magical glass arm, and Shuren just thought she was the bee's knees, and she did not reciprocate his attention in any way whatsoever. So he's just <laughs> kind of pining for this really awesome sorcerer lady. Monty, I think you had a very special gift for imbuing your NPCs with just a uniqueness. In a city, I guess that's important because you have to help us remember who these people are. But I, I always felt that you put a lot of a lot of great time and energy into imagining an NPC that nobody's ever seen before. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think you're right in that I think in this because you guys were going to be encountering so many people, there had to be like everyone, well, maybe not everyone, but a lot of them had like a thing, right? Yeah. She had a glass arm. There was uh, Prince Ironheart. His, he was a paladin whose heart glowed so brightly that you could see it through his chest. Um, mm -hmm. Things like that. Um, he had the runes on his teeth. Yeah. And the Iron Mage. My favorite enemies were the Vi because they were so incompetent that we <laughs> <laughs> weren't supposed to be though. <laughs> it's like this Assassin's Guild that keeps trying to take us out and they're just terrible <laughs> at it. And it, it just stemmed from that like fight at level two or three and some of them like ambushed us in the alley and Monty just kept rolling miss, miss, yes. miss. Yeah. Miss. yeah. The guy were like, these guys are <laughs> <laughs> the hell's going on here? It's like a comedy <laughs> sketch or something. I know, right. they ended and up that... being like stormtroopers in Star Wars, <laughs> right? <laughs> we were practically provoking them into attacking us at some point in the campaign. <laughs> just so we could laugh. Yeah, that's uh yeah, that's a sore spot. <laughs> <laughs> Only because I wanted to, you know, develop this real mystique, right? And it got <laughs> totally the other way. Uh, didn't Eric uh, Zophus have a uh, an MP a character called Offendus as his cohort or something? MP an NPC? I just remember oh, Offendus. And <laughs> yes. like, he didn't mean to name him Offend Us. <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> it's spelled with it an E, really but... He it was, was very appropriate. <laughs> um, he was this arrogant jerk. Uh, he was kind of like a, I, I think he was like a henchman. Yeah, um, yeah. And he yeah. was this arrogant jerk. I think he was a cleric. Um, I think he was a wizard. He was a crafting wizard. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, Eric Mona has. Uh, I wish. I wish uh, he would have uh, been able to join us because he has. He has a unique talent of creating characters that are terrible, that everyone hates, and yet <laughs> loves. Right? You kind of love to hate. Uh, Zophus himself was that character, right? Yes. He was, had this uh, yes. very uh, well. He loved sweets, if I remember correctly, or food of all kind. He was very condescending to everyone yes. he met. And then there was Barbatos. You remember Barbatos? Barbatos was, I think you might be actually conflating Bar Barbatos. No, you know was, what? I think I am. You're right. Was a huge fat wizard that ate That's all correct. the time. And yeah. uh, thank you. Yeah. And I think we determined at one point that every other player character at one point had punched uh, Barbatos <laughs> <laughs> based on something that he did or said. And yeah. And but Eric was cool, right? Because he would say, "Yeah, you know, out of character, he would say, yeah, I totally deserve that." I, you, yeah. I wasn't there. Wasn't there, wasn't there one game where he had to play chess against somebody and he didn't know how to play? The character didn't know how to play chess and he was just bluffing his way through the game. Is that? That sounds familiar. Yes. Really right. Was that? Oh, I don't remember which character that was, but there was a there was a point at which we were there was a I chess think, game. I think it was Barbatos who was trying to 
bluff his way through the game, even though he had no idea what he was doing. <laughs> yeah. It was probably some like tallest version of chess. I don't know if it was actually chess. Right. Yeah. 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 It was, it was not literally chess. Yeah. Something like that though. Yeah. Uh, let me look at some of these other questions. Um, uh, so uh, there's uh, why did the PCs go to the moon and what did breaking off a part of that serve? Does anyone remember that? I, I, I do. Yeah, there was something going wrong in the Primal campaign. And, oh, there was a rift into the, like, the underworld, the afterworld. Right, or, into the land of the dead, yep. Mm-hmm. And the only way to stop that was to use, like, destroy a powerful artifact. And one of them was this crazy flying ship that the elves had. Another one was this magical gem. And then the third one was to use the Valve's moon. And so we went to the moon. Because the moon was the source of magic in, in that campaign. Yeah. And we had to deal with those solars, the Lords of the Seven Chains, that were like guarding the chains that keep the Galcha trapped in the world. Spoiler, sorry. And some of them had been corrupted, but we used like a wish to break off a piece of the moon and steer it through this rift to seal the rift to the, to the undead afterworld because they were just gonna flood the world and destroy everything. Like literally in that campaign, we saw undead for the first time, and there was an NPC there. It's like those head don't even exist in the world. What are you doing? Just horrible abomination on life itself. Did we right. create that rift by accident? I... No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, that was us. No, that was the bad guys. Uh, no, because remember the, the the whole thing about the Premal campaign was that it was the world was brand new, right? And so there weren't undead yet, right? No one had breached that veil until that until that happened. So this and you so you sealed it up, but you did you sealed it imperfectly, um, and so there would there would be undead in the world, but but the world wasn't going to get overrun with undead. Mm-hmm. So you saved the world. There's a lot of that. <laughs> uh, let's see. So um, one person asked, "Cat Cat Who Walks asks, how did the campaign shape or change you as GMs or players?" Oh, oh, that's a really good question. I think that. Before this, I don't think I would have ever thought about playing so many different characters, but I ultimately ended up playing four different characters in Talos, and it just gave me an opportunity to just, you know, to realize that, you know, I don't have to, I can try many things, you know, and I, I, can, I can have a good time in, in a GM, D&D sort of sense, and then, you know, try something else. And, and Antolis, I think, was, since it lasted so long, it allowed me to come at it in so many different ways. And I, I don't know if that changed me, but something I always think about. It makes as sense. A DM, as a DM, I liked that there were, the city felt alive because there were many different things going on. And if the players ever got tired of dealing with one thing, they could just sort of shift over and deal with something else. And there was something else there for them to do. So this idea that as a DM, building a campaign or a location that has maybe two or three arcs or stories going on simultaneously, so that there is that ability to kind of skip around and shake things up and occasionally maybe even have arcs collide and, and that kind of thing. It just adds a realism to the world. It, it gives you the sense that there's, that this is a place where actual things are happening, not just because the characters are involved, but because it's a real living, breathing place. I think for me, it was kind of cementing the idea that I am not a power gamer. I understand the rules and I could totally power game if I want to, but I really like building characters that are just fun in their own unique way. Like Shurn was a triple class fighter rogue cleric, which is just not an optimal combo for anything, but he was fun. He just kind of fit that jack of all trades sort of thing. And I like games, campaigns and game systems that allow me to do something like that. For me, the big the, the big difference was, I mean, even though I've, you know, so so Talos was, uh, what, uh, twenty years ago more about about twenty years ago, which is crazy to think about. Right. Um, uh, up in I I'd been you know running games for twenty years before that, but. I had never really run a super long-term campaign. I think, uh, you know, maybe, maybe a year at most. Right. But, but I was more the kind of GM that was constantly, Oh, let's try this game. Oh, I have a new idea for a whole new adventure or whatever. Right. And Talos was the first setting that 
I I created and really kind of, I mean, there were there were times when I felt like, you know, uh, if if I was somehow magically teleported to that place, I could make my way around, right? I mean, it just it was all so uh, ingrained in me, and and you know, I had never created anything with the level of detail, um, and with and you know. I, I think probably before and since I'm uh, I'm a GM that probably does a lot of a lot more improv um, and just kind of comes up with not entirely right but but I'm, I'm making stuff up on the fly a fair bit from session to session um, but Talos wasn't like that for me Talos was was lots of prep um, uh, but but it was fun it was it was it was fun to make things that detailed right um, it, it made me appreciate those kind of settings, settings like the Forgotten Realms or, you know, the Star Wars universe or something yeah. like where, you know, has just has lots and lots of detail. Yeah. I like that you can still create an authentic D&D experience, even if it's just a city urban campaign, too. Like you don't have to give up dungeons. You don't have to give up monsters. You know, if you just think about it, you can actually make it all work. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, that was a lot of fun. Um, let's see. So the bunny of doom asks, uh, what are the challenges of GMing in an urban environment? And, uh, then also asks, uh, what's the, what are the challenges of playing as PCs? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll take the GMing part. The challenges are, uh, kind of what we already mentioned about. There's lots of NPCs to keep track of and, and it's really important to make everything super dynamic so that, you know, you go and you talk to this person and this place in the city, and then you come back and talk to them six months later, things might have changed, right? Um, their, their, their life has moved on. They're not, they're not, in, you know, the guy in a video game who's just sitting in the store saying, do you want some armor? Right. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, that's, not, that's a big challenge and keeping all of that straight. Um, and uh uh, I'm sure there are other things, but that definitely is the the one that I found challenging. But it, you know, again, in a in a fun way, um, you know. It, I think. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I, I had a challenge for a PC, but it looks like you're still. Oh. Hey. Sorry, Milo crawled up on my lap. Hi, Milo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. You got to get down. He's very cute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and very calm. <laughs> he is very very chill. <laughs> what were you gonna say bruce uh um so i think as a player everything that you were saying kind of is reflected back as like a, a challenge of like there's so much going on here there's so many threads there's so many arcs and we come across so many npcs that as a player i felt it really behooved me to really take better notes than i had ever taken before who is this NPC? who is this NPC? right that's when i first started uh for a that period of time anyway, taking notes into a Excel spreadsheet, I think maybe. And, uh, you know, just like, oh, who is this? Ah, yes, that's, this is this person, this is this person, this is this thing. So just to kind of, to replicate your experience as a, as a person who would actually be there, of course you would know as the character, but as the player, it was a challenge to be like, okay, what, what, what will I be doing right now? And you have to sink yourself into that, that environment. And the fun part about that, from, from the DM's chair is to make sure that if you've got players that are doing that, to reward them for that, right? Because um, I could then, once the campaign's going for months and months and, and the players have a big list of NPCs and they know all these people and who's good at this and who ha knows about that, then I can set up situations and I don't even have to put out like new hooks, right? I can just say, oh, there's, you know, some strange thing going on and, and it's magical related and you guys would know, okay, well, we should talk to this person and we should go, you know, track down someone from, you know, we should uh, go talk to Javika Noor, right? Because she knows a lot about magic. And right. and that's very, that's both fun and rewarding as the, for the GM, but but hopefully also for the, for the players, because, you know, it, it, it's one thing to have the GM say, well, maybe you could go talk to blah, 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 right? But to have the players come up with that on their own, right? Oh, we should go talk to Javika Noor. Certainly one of the things as a player I found is 
it was easy to fall in love with Tallis, even though there's a lot of terrible things going on. It, it made you want to stay in this. <laughs> made you want place. to. It is an awful place, <laughs> but but <laughs> you still want to stick around and kind of maybe make it better because there are people that you care about and things like that. Um, one of the lessons I picked up is uh, when Sarai got high enough level, he bought some property in the city. Oh yeah, he had, he had a place, and I thought that was important. In the nobles' quarter. Um, Exactly. It was important <laughs> just so a we could have a place to retreat to if we had to, but also to give my character a sense of, okay, he's in this place for the long haul. And that's actually, I think that may have influenced work that I did on a later product. Um, I did a product called Waterdeep Dragon Heist. And one of the elements I felt it needed was a, a base of operations for the characters in the city of Waterdeep, a place that you can get and call your own and then shape to ser serve your party's whims. And so that was sort of pre-built or baked into an adventure. And I'm sure it had to do with my experience playing in Tallis. I can remember like the first time you brought the other characters to your house and you already had this cool house. And it was all you need. <laughs> you know, we had worked on, figured out, you know, the design of it and, and everything. And, you know, and all the other characters who had been focused on other things, you know, were just suddenly walking around going, this is your house? <laughs> <laughs> How long, when did you buy it? How did you get all this stuff in here? <laughs> exactly, right? Yeah. Everyone else is still living out of the, you know, their room <laughs> or whatever, right? Yeah, that was super fun. Uh, uh, Zamusel asked how many eras there were in the Talos universe. Um, well, basically two that we've talked about, Primal and Talos. There's this, there's all this history that goes on in the middle part that kind of establishes uh, a lot of the themes that are set up in Talos. Um, there's a, there's, you know, there's a, the, a, a, you know, things that happened with the empire and because in the time of the campaign, the empire is fragmenting and there are three people who, you know, lay claim to the throne and there's a conflict between uh, the major religion and people who use arcane magic. And um, so, so I guess that's sort of an era too, but that's nothing that we played through. That's just there to set things up. Um, let's see, uh, phlegm sneezy <laughs> asks, um, can we recall a lucky or unlucky die roll that led to significant unforeseen story development? Um, almost certainly, right? Um, whole vi, the whole vi thing demonstrates that, right? Your, yeah, your rolls sure of the die does. led to them being not our nemesis. <laughs> it does. Um, hmm. After 20 years, it's hard to remember a specific die roll. Yeah. It is. It is. It's a general trend of bad luck or good luck. It's different. But I well, I mean, you know, and, and you you certainly remember the the crit on the beholder, right? I mean, that didn't necessarily change things, although it probably was very instrumental in that fight, which was a very crux point in the storyline of the game. I do recall that Bruce's die rolls were often very cold. <laughs> he had he had clearly bad I'll be dice. happy to know that I've 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 changed that completely. And really? I never roll badly anymore. <laughs> okay. It's, it's lying true. to you. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid to report that that, that has, has maintained this. I, oh shit. I still routinely roll one, the very first roll that comes in the game. Or if you can roll a zero, I will roll a zero. <laughs> the very first roll of any game. Nice, and, nice. I yeah. think Keith Strom had the rec had the second worst rolls in the campaign, but you, you, nobody could compete with your dice. This, this was a challenge in creating characters, trying to create characters that the dice didn't matter as much. So like, <laughs> a wizard character, maybe that's why I changed to Cannabium, because at least if they right. made their save, I'd still do half damage. Half damage, yeah. yeah. Whenever I think about Keith Strom's character in the Talith campaign, he had a monk. Uh, whose name escapes me, but um, I think it was in the Thursday night group. And he, so there was this trap. You guys were down, I think probably in Dwarven Hearth, which is this big ancient Dwarven city. And um, there was a trap that had multiple teleport points. So if you went to, if you stepped on this certain area or passed through this certain area, you'd get teleported back and another one would teleport you. And so 
he could leap super far, right? He could leap like 120 feet or something like that. And so he tried to just leap down this hallway that had these multiple teleport traps. And he got, because of the momentum, he got, (laughs) he got stuck in this loop where he was teleported to one spot and then teleported to another spot. And then his own momentum from his leap just kept carrying him and he was stuck and someone had to like, Oh, him out of it. <laughs> I'm also suddenly remembering the time that the Thursday night group, you ran into a dragon really early on. Uh, do you remember this? It was like this big red dragon and it was going to destroy you probably or, or kill a lot of you. And so, but you just, you negotiated with it. Uh, do you oh, remember this? Yeah. And, it's coming back to me now. And you promised it uh, a cow. <laughs> <laughs> He said, we'll bring you a cow and you could eat the cow and it would be way better than eating us. And so it was fantastic because we had this whole, an entire game session of you guys having to navigate this trap filled dungeon to get a cow down from this. Alive. (laughs) Alive. Down to this dragon. And God, like we getting it over the pit this. traps and <laughs> the, the the great legacy of the company of the Black Lantern. <laughs> How hurting. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. That wasn't the reason you were called the company of the Black Lantern, is because like early on, like someone had a lantern because it was your source of light, and somebody got you got fireballed and the thing was just all burned and scorched. Yeah. You're kind of you're like you're, you're yeah. your group. Yeah, it was a, it was the most pathetic lantern you could imagine. So it was apropos. <laughs> yeah. Yep. <laughs> You're gonna say something, Bruce? I feel like I remember that conversation, and we were talking about because we wanted a name and we needed something iconic. And I had thought we had thought of the Glenn Cook books, and they had just named themselves after uh, the company of something that they carried around with them and now I can't come up with it. <laughs> and, but we're like, well, we're carrying around not this pendant or this spike or this uh, thing, but we're carrying around this black lantern. Let's call it, let's, let's just go with it. And no one will ever know <laughs> yeah. this yeah, now uh, we're cool. actual truth. Now, now everyone knows, but. <laughs> I, I actually, my memory, I, in my memory, you were the one Bruce who was really pushing for I, to have a cool name for the, for the, because I had, had just for the first time read Glenn Cook's uh, company, Black Company books. So I think that's, uh, yeah, you know, I was a little influenced by, the, by that fiction at the time. And we had a Black Lantern. Cool, cool. That, a lot of good that did us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that probably lasted until, you know, who knows where that lantern went up. Yeah, I, I, th- <laughs> I think the lantern just left, no longer became relevant a few it's, sessions it's enshrined someplace though right at, at this yeah. point 20 years yeah. later i, I, I think that, like it was one of the things where like i had assumed that you just kind of left the black lantern somewhere but then later i think it was keith was like no i've got it right and he had it written <laughs> down in his character sheet okay. and he pulls it out of his backpack and yeah i think he i think he kept it awesome um all right well yeah obviously we could keep talking forever um, about all of this, but we probably should wrap things up. Um, thank you guys so much. These are all great memories. I have, I have such fond, fond memories of, of playing D and D with you guys. Um, so, uh, uh, our wonderful, uh, community director Darcy is telling me, or is reminding me, um, to tell you guys to go to uh, uh, tolus5e.com. That's P-T-O-L-U-S 5e.com. Um, and uh, the Kickstarter ends on March 20th. So uh, please check that out. If if any of these gaming memories sound like something that you want to uh, make a part of your own gaming life, um, that'd be great. Um, uh, Chris, thank you so much. Chris Perkins D and D on Twitter, and uh, uh, Sean, thank you. You're Sean K Reynolds at on Twitter, and Bruce, you are, are you Bruce Cordell or Bruce R Cordell? Just Bruce Cordell. Bruce Cordell. Oh, okay. yeah. right. And I am Monty J Cook on Twitter. We're we're all on Twitter. Um, and I wanted to remind everyone that we're going to do another, uh, one of these chats, um, 
on Wednesday, March 18th at 8 p.m. Pacific. And that's going to be uh, uh, a couple of us are returning, um, um, Sean and Bruce and I. We're also going to be joined by Andy Collins and Jesse Decker, which I'm guessing we're going to hear even more Thursday Night Group, Company of the Black Lantern escapades. <laughs> yes, yes. I haven't talked to Jesse in a long time, so give him my regards. I will. I'd be happy to. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking, looking forward to that as well. Um, all right. Well, thank you guys again. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for watching this. And, uh, you know, I hope, I hope whatever game you're playing and whatever setting you're in, you, you have as great a time as we had in Tullus. Yes. Play role playing games. They're good for the soul. <laughs> <laughs>